Right. <clears throat> and we should be all right it says we are live hello everyone welcome to my channel again this is a this is a stream that i wanted to have a couple of i will say i think a week ago and we kind of made this happen i have it me today father mikhail baleka i think that's the correct way to say your name right mikhail you're, you're about the you're about the only one who's even pronounced my last name properly so so bonus yeah. points <laughs> yeah definitely uh, so I have here Father Mihail with me. Uh, he has a YouTube channel, which is on my description below called Living Orthodox. And uh, you can definitely go check that channel out. Uh, and, you know, Father, you can also go ahead and introduce yourself because you will probably do a better job at that than I can. So the floor okay, is yours. Thank you, David. Thank, thank you, David. And thank you for, for having me with you on your on your channel. It's an honor. Um, my name is Father Mikhail Balika. And... Uh, I'm an Orthodox priest. I'm from Canada. Uh, hence, my my some people have pointed to my Canadian accent before in some of my videos. <laughs> and um, I'm a recently ordained priest uh, with Rocor. And uh, and I myself am also a convert and uh, still pretty new to the faith in a lot of ways. And uh, you know, by the grace of God and through uh, a lot of difficulties and trial, I've I've had some experience and. Uh, have have had some good tutelage from my spiritual father and from from other wonderful priests that I've known, and uh, by the grace of God, they decided to uh, my bishop decided to ordain me to the priesthood uh, this past May. Uh, actually, I was I was ordained on the day that we uh, buried uh, Metropolitan Alarion of, of Blessed Memory, the, who was the first hierarch of of the Church abroad. For for those who are not familiar with Rocor or um or some of these names and uh it was it was quite the experience so uh of course what this left me with was a, an even stronger desire to get into my ministry and to share things with people and so i, I started my channel as kind of a a form of spiritual outreach uh you know a little bit of catechesis um you know there, there will of course naturally be comparison videos between us and other religions but uh and, and where orthodoxy is is the only one that's correct um, but my main goal, of course, is, is wanting to teach people how to live in their faith, how to live in the Orthodox faith. And I think really, uh, which I wanted to talk about for a while, which uh, thanks to this wonderful blessing and occasion to be able to speak with David, uh, you know, and to share this with the wider audience, um, is spiritual warfare. Uh, that, that really is ultimately at the root of everything. Um, Archbishop Averkey has said that everyone regardless, is engaged in spiritual warfare. And uh, th this is really the yoke of the Orthodox Christian. Um, you know, in spiritual warfare, it takes on many, many different faces, right? It, it, can, it can take on, uh, you know, just even the seeming struggle to get going into your prayers. You know, even if it's hard to get started with your prayer life, that's where uh, the most basic um, struggle is. You know, it's, it's getting that prayer rule established, it's getting that routine established, and fighting against uh, your desire for comfort and freeze, right? A lot, of, a lot of us wake up in the morning, and the first thing we usually want is a cup of coffee. And, uh, you know, really the first thing we should be doing when we wake up is crossing ourselves and even just simply praying the prayer of the publican. But, but sometimes this is hard for people. You know, they, they have prayer books, and people get excited, and they buy the prayer books, they buy the prayer ropes. And they don't know where to begin. You know, you'll, you'll see those guys who will be like, oh, yeah, I got my Orthodox starter kit. You know, I've got my Orthodox study Bible, my Jordanville prayer book. Um, oh, yeah. Time to pray for three hours. The moment I yeah. wake up, like everyone just gets hyper. <laughs> and then yeah. you get you get that mode and it lasts for a couple a couple of while. And then when the burnout happens, I think that's where the real challenge happens. I, there's some games where there's like the, you know, you play a game and there's like the newbie boost, like the rookie boost. Like I think a lot of new yeah. converts get that, but <laughs> then it disappears after one season, and you got to pick it up yourself. <laughs> yeah, you get your one week of uh, prayer experience boost. You know, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's true, and a lot of that it's the zeal, which you know keep the zeal, but you have to temper it. You have to realize it. it's like even when guys start working out at the gym for. First time and they think yeah i'm gonna go get really big and really strong and they they go and they hit a bunch of weights and then the next day they can't even lift their arms and, and it can be like that with the prayer life too or or it's like david just said there you know it's like you get the newbie experience boost 
And all of a sudden it runs out and you're thinking, oh, well, now it's a grind. And we're, we're all expecting to have this Theosis or to see the uncreated light almost. And I mean, most of us are never going to see that. Um, most of us are never going to have the experience of, uh, of hesychastic monks. You know, we, we just simply don't live in an atmosphere that uh, really provides that. But we can still have that inner transformation. Um, you know, we may not see the same extreme results that people like St. Paisios or Elder Joseph the Hesychast um, have had, but we can still have that inner transformation. We can still bring that light into our lives. We can still have the the light of Christ. But but this is this is a muscle that we have to exercise. Prayer is a muscle, and so the the first thing that any new convert should do, really, when when they get their their prayer rope and their their study Bible and their Jordanville prayer book, they're using, is consult their priest and say, okay, you know, I'm in over my head. And that's the first thing. And the re- then the reason why this is the most important step in spiritual warfare is because this is exercising the virtue that the devil doesn't have. And, and that is hum- uh, humility. The, the devil's sin that caused him to fall was pride. And pride, for every one of us, is always going to be that last passion that we're going to have to struggle against, that we're going to have to root out. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a cancer. It's, it's a weed. And once it gets its roots in... We have to try to take out the larger roots so that the, the smaller ones, as St. Paisios um, had once said, will dry out. And so that can be very difficult. And a lot of this begins with us looking at ourselves and saying, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of young. I'm kind of stupid. And I don't know what's up. So we turn to our to our spiritual fathers, which I, I have a spiritual father that I turn to. And, and I'll say to him, you know, I'm a priest, but I don't I don't know how to how to pray right clearly not doing something right, because if I was, I would be a better person. And you have to remind yourself every day that as far as you get, you only get as far as you do on the grace of God. You know, you you only you only get as far as 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 Christ will carry you and and as as far as you'll allow him to carry. You know, it's a it's a synergistic uh, relationship. Yeah, exactly. Uh, It says St. Paul says it's faith working through love, right? It's faith that is energized by love. If you don't have that, you don't really have a living faith. Exactly. And, and if you don't have a living faith, and if you're not allowing your faith to kind of permeate all the aspects of your life, uh, then you're, you're going to come up short. Um, you're, you're not going to be exercising uh, love in all that you do. And, and love takes many forms. A lot of people think it's soft and, you know, oh, we don't want to say anything to offend anyone. That's not true. You know, the truth is offensive. Um, Jesus is, is not, is anything but politically correct. You know, when you when you even read what he what he says, or when he refers to the to the Pharisees as a brood of vipers, um, it's an unsavory term to call some, especially when you understand how vipers are born. You know, they they hatch inside their mothers and they eat their way out. You know, and, and this is telling us something about the spiritual life that the the demons, the devil, had such a foothold in these men because of their pride that their passions grew out of control and have now started to devour them from the inside, but. In the process of this, the closer that we bring ourselves to the passions, the closer we bring ourselves to the demons. Um, my spiritual father once told me that the more we pray, naturally, the closer we will come to God. You know, it's like with the prodigal son. We take a step forward, and God will take a thousand steps towards us. But when we stop praying, when, when we allow that despondency and that, that exhaustion to kick in, and we don't even say one heartfelt Lord have mercy, we get closer to the devil. He, he, he sneaks up on us at that point. Yeah, I'd also add in, in that discussion, uh, and this is kind of like a recent find that I had while I was reading, actually, Dr. David Bradshaw's Aristotle East and West. Um, he points mm-hmm. out, for example, both from Scripture and St. Paul and from early Christian apologists, the, the way the Scriptures use the term energy, and it has a very kind of like as- ascetical significance, and it's, Mean it has this meaning of the supernatural force or power that has possess- possessive strength, and so to speak, as to give an example, when you you know move away from God, when you basically will the same thing as the evil one does, you become possessed by demons in that sense, and they and they you know gain root in you through the passions and such. Yes. And so we are to so our aim is to essentially you know move towards God. And allow God to possess us in in that sense. In fact, 
Uh, St. Paul talks about, you know, this kind of possession that we can do good things through God in Philippians 2, 12, 13, for example. Uh, he talks about, and St. Paul has, a, I believe this is in his uh, epistle to Ephesians, but I might be wrong, uh, where he talks about the Antichrist, says the, the Satan will have complete possessive power over Antichrist, right? So yes, uh, yeah, he'll we don't be totally want to possessed see... by demonic energies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is a very, this is an early Christian concept that is actually very important, and it's like less theological, philosophical, but very relevant to ascetic life that I found it is ultimately, as Saint Athanagoras says, we should avoid the energies or the powers of the demons. And at spiritual Absolutely. warfare, the way I see it is basically that. Is, is avoiding that and fighting against that. You, you hit it on the nail. And, uh, and you know, thanks for tuning in, everyone. <laughs> but it's, no, but that is it. That is truly it. That That is the crux of the spiritual warfare, is that it, ultimately, at the end of the day, you have to make a decision who is going to be the one energizing you. Are, are you going to be energized by the devil and, and his demons and become possessed by demonic energies? And what a lot of people don't realize is that possession isn't always like what we see in the movies. Um, possession can be very subtle and a lot of the time the way the best way the devil can get us to cooperate with him is by getting us to want to cooperate with him he's not necessarily going to take your hand and make you do it he's going to make you think that you want to do it and that's how he's going to get you to do it because ultimately at the end of the day the, the devil made me do it is not an excuse um, the devil will encourage you to do it he'll make really good arguments he'll really tempt you but at the end of the day if you keep your prayer life in order and if you stay close to God and allow yourself to be energized by God, then you will have the strength to not give in to that, you know, to not go through the demonosis. Yeah, it, it's kind of, remind, you know, you, you mentioned the, you know, it, possession is not like the movies. Yeah, people think it's like kind of this unconsensual thing. Actually, it's very consensual. It's uh, the people who are possessed themselves allow something like that to happen. It doesn't happen because they get overpowered. It's because they allow demons in them that's why you know things like uh dmt and things like that you should you should avoid that because it's opening yourself up to spiritual forces and it's like opening your door in a bad neighborhood i mean anyone's gonna go in and plunder your soul right and that's exactly, exactly what you don't want you want to open your door only to a few select people it's true. And, and that's why you also have to even be careful in who you ask to be your spiritual father a lot of the time, too. You know, if you see certain red flags with a spiritual father, then go and look for another one. And, you know, uh, some people don't like the idea of doing it over the phone, but it, it's doable. You know, if you have to do your confessions over the phone, confess to someone who is going to listen to you and who's going to assess what is happening, find the illness that you're suffering from and give you the appropriate medicine. Because that's another side of spiritual warfare that isn't covered enough. These days. And a lot of the time, it's, it's my fellow priest who overlook this. And that's the importance of penances. Um, the importance of the penance in rehabilitating the individual is a lot of people think penance is like a punishment. And, and I'm going to come back to the possession thing because penances are very important and against that. Um, actually, I'll, maybe I'll share some examples because I've, in the short time I've been a priest, I've seen some crazy things. <laughs> um, and, and I've heard some stories from other priests. I know of one who dealt with a woman who became possessed. And this happened very subtly. And, and, and actually, this, this happened throughout the majority of her life and culminated in a final event um, that resulted in a very aggressive, uh, preternatural manifestation of a demonic um, entity who had possessed the person. But it started with something as simple as her thinking that when she was a little girl that she had this imaginary friend and the imaginary friend she described it, and this was what was audio you know, when she imagined talking to this thing um it never opened its mouth you know it, it was like she said it spoke into her mind and you know it, it asked her if it wanted to marry her and in her innocence she thought oh you know you know being married to this thing would just simply mean we're friends and you know she wasn't raised orthodox she was raised in a catholic home and so um the, you know the spirituality there very nominal and and was a little bit on the lukewarm side at the time and you know the, the parents just kind of fluffed it off they laughed it off and this woman grew up and had reoccurring nightmares a lot of strange issues that that were happening with her throughout her life and uh it, it was after one issue her marriage that caused her to fall into a, a deep state of despair 
And that's when the thing came in. And, uh, you know, everyone thought she just had a mental break or that she was going through, um, you know, because she, she had just had a child, you know, that was going through some kind of postpartum thing and medications weren't working. And, and at the end of the day, the only thing that was able to help was, was unction. And, uh, and of course, when we do unction services, we do confession, we do the actual anointing with the, the unction, and then we, we give communion. And then after that, it was getting this person's prayer life on track and rehabilitating them. And that's where penances come in. Now, in a lot of cases, it's never going to be that extreme. But, you know, if you're confessing the same thing over and and it's not getting any better, you're coming in every week saying, hey, Father, you know, you know that thing I'm struggling with? Well, you know, I, I did it again. And he goes, OK, just take communion. And, and, and you know, the person might think, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's how I get stronger. But. You're not getting stronger. You're you're staying stuck, and the worst thing is, is that now you've got a potential threat here with taking holy communion in an unworthy manner. You know because you have an unrepented sin, and how is how do we know if a sin is unrepented if you're not giving it up? You know if you're struggling to give it up due to long-term habitual uh, issues such as with smoking, alcoholism, pornography, these things really stick and take time to root out, and there is times where again it would be good to have that penance where say uh with a young man you tell him 40 days no communion you know here's a prayer rule follow this for 40 days do this you know and and there's of course room for leniency like if they make it to 35 days and they and you tell them look you know be careful be on guard through the next week and then come to holy communion you know, you don't just start them up again, because if you if you do that as well, then you run the other issue of the person falling into a deeper set of despair or into a form of spiritual delusion. And so, you know, having penances, having a prayer rule, it's a delicate balance. You have to really be aware of where you are and your spiritual father has to be aware of where you are. And it, it can take time. You know, don't necessarily expect that you can talk to a priest day one and he's going to know the perfect prayer rule for you. He might give you a light recommendation to build the foundation a little bit. But don't expect to be doing, you know, 100 Jesus prayers right away off the hop. That's, you know, for some people, that is genuinely too much. And, and that's where I've seen other cases of, you know, or heard, I should say, of other cases of demonic possession is where people have deluded themselves into thinking that they're or that they have these spiritual gifts. Yes, Orthodox Christians. And they don't. Some of these people do. Some, some people don't. Um, mo most of the time, you won't find that outside of a and uh, in modern times, you know, these things become rarer. Yeah. And I, I will say with, with things like Prelas, definitely uh, what we see online generally, in my experience, at least, it's like there's like major Prelas when you really deluded. And then there's kind of like minor instances uh, where obviously it's still dangerous, but it's more like. Uh, for example, I see this in a lot of new people, new converts who are intelligent. Uh, not as me, but they are still quite intelligent, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, jokes aside, but, you know, it, you know, there might be intelligent people who are above average at the very least. And they think that they have everything figured out in two months. I know I had a lot of that, like, inclination when I first became Orthodox, but... I generally had that inclination in general, and I think a lot of people have that inclination too. And I think that's kind of like a form of prelist because you're basically saying, you know, I'm so intelligent that I figured everything about this fate in two months. You probably have not. You probably don't know what you're talking about, and you're probably going to realize that you're very off mark. And uh, I think a big medicine from my personal experience is actually, first of all, respecting the fate and accepting that you need to do hard work. I think when you don't accept two of these things, it's very difficult to convince yourself to get out of that. Not that we can ever fully get out of this spiritual trap. It's, you know, these are traps and we will they fall are. into these traps uh, at times. But the, the most common form of these traps, I think, is just instant thinking you can become a representative and like uh, you're so good at presenting this that you can just defeat anyone by hearing a couple of rehearsed arguments now again i see this more often in other religions and denominations but it shouldn't happen in ours is what i'm trying to say it should absolutely happen yeah. never and that's why like me personally with my channel what i try to do is kind of like just high quality hot hard work and 
you know, citing sources and encouraging people to read what I'm actually talking about when they have the free time. Because the last thing I want to have is someone watching a video of mine and then just going to a group of people and just repeating the things that I say, because there are going to yeah. be responses and you're not going to know how to react to them. Whereas, for example, I might, right? You might know better, basically. Mm -hmm. And I actually want to connect this with a question. You talked about prayer rules. So uh, I'm not asking you to become more spiritual fathers and give us a prayer rule or anything like that. But what I do wonder is for people who are new to the faith, think catechumens, inquirers, even newly baptized, uh, what is kind of like the average prayer rule that is, that we can start as a baseline bit, not as like what's good, because it's never going to be good unless we pray ceaselessly. But yeah. what is a good baseline for new people uh, I, in your idea? That's a good question. That, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, a good baseline for a solid prayer rule for people just coming in even, is, is kind of just looking at the standard prayer book and seeing, you know, in every prayer book, you have the opening morning prayers. And the way that they're structured um, in, in the wisdom of, of the church and how you look at each jurisdiction, you look at the, the, the prayer book by uh, Holy Transfiguration Monastery by Jordanville, you know, each day they tell you, you know, get up, make the sign of the cross, right? You know, remember that, it, you know, our resurrection occurs because of his crucifixion and resurrection. Right, and so we, we have to remember that even waking from sleep is uh, is a remembering of that. It's a remembering of the resurrection that we will await at the end of time, um, in the eschaton. And so we wake up and we cross ourselves. And then the best thing to do is to start with prayer of the publican. You know, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Um, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Because right in those two prayers, we we have everything that you need to know about salvation. And then I would say from there, uh, most of the time, what I recommend is, is for them to do the morning treparian, um, and then skip to the Our Father, and then Psalm 50, and then end it off with the Creed and the prayer to the Holy Theotokos. And the reason being is, is that there's, there's, of course, a specific Orthodox flavor uh, to this prayer rule, because what is at its heart is repentance. And you'll notice that in every... Um, prayer book, uh, when it comes to the morning prayers, when it comes to the evening prayers, there's always this sense of repentance and wanting to change and wanting to do better the next day. Um, Psalm 50 is, is an incredibly important prayer for that. Um, I encourage people to, to memorize it, you know, commit it to your memory, because it'll be there when you need it. You know, you may not always have a prayer book on hand, and it'd be good for, for you to at least know how to call on the Psalms. Um, we, we could do maybe uh, later on a bit more of a talk on why the Psalms prayers. Um, but uh, it's important to have that one in your back pocket. And then, of course, the creed is important because it contains all the salvific dogmas of the church in there, all, all the things that you need to know the faith in its simplest form. And then, of course, the, the ending prayer was saying it is truly meet to bless the Otheotokos, because this, this tells us very important things about who Christ is, um, you know, who the saints are, who the mother of God is. And then, of course, you know, we, we end it properly with the with the proper doxology or the glorification, the glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, you know, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercies, and then, you know, and then through the prayers of our Holy Father, so Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. You know, and that gives you that that flavor for the prayers, that kind of gives you the, the, the groundwork, so to speak, to work from there, and then you can kind of build on top of it. But I feel that those, those prayers, especially that I just mentioned, are uh, very important for building the foundation. Um, they kind of lay that groundwork for having the repentant mind for developing that humility. Because, uh, you know, humility, at least in patristic psychology, is more than what we see with the, see with the Catholics. Um, a lot of the time, the concept of humility is very distorted in both regions there, with, with both those um, schismatic groups. Um, with the Protestants, humility to them a lot of the time is just thinking, well, you know, I accept that, that Jesus Christ is God and that God knows. I, you know, I, I'm just a sinner and I, and, and they think that's enough for humility, but then you, you'll talk to many of them and they'll almost think that they are sinless, you know, or that they can interpret the Bible, uh, you know, and that they have the correct interpretation. Uh, the voice cut up, can you repeat what you just said? Because I think, uh, when you move away from your mic, the voice oh, cuts off did, a little did bit. It, yeah. Did it cut off? My, yeah, my the last, yeah, the last sentence was cut off. <laughs> 
Okay, yeah, with um, basically with how humility um, to the Protestant mind is this idea that just because you acknowledge that you know there is a God and that Jesus Christ is Lord, that that means you have humility, and that isn't enough to constitute humility. Um, the devil, you know, acknowledges Christ as Lord. This is why the name of Jesus has authority over the. Um, you know, this isn't enough to constitute humility, and a lot of the times it can lead people into delusion. Um, and, and into further spiritual delusion. We see a lot of pre-lists in the communities, you know, especially with how the Protestants think that they can interpret the Scripture on their own and in a vacuum. But then you've got 30,000 different interpretations to that Scripture, and all of them claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit, which then creates a problem, because you know, they can't all be. Yeah, I mean, sure, the Holy Spirit has many energies, as St. Paul says in 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, but that doesn't mean there are many interpretations. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so you can't really... He, he, yeah, he's really not saying, that. okay, you know, uh, you guys, yeah, you're, you know, that, that stuff we call gibberish is tongues, and oh, but it, telling the Baptist there is no tongues, or that there's a cessation of, of the spiritual gifts, yeah. you know, the Holy Spirit's not going to reveal these contradictory things he's not going to contradict himself yeah you know and, and that's where the, the holy fathers are really the best way to, to look at it no one should read the scripture without reading the holy fathers or having some kind of connection to them yeah i, I definitely agree and uh with, with that point w what comes to my mind is that a couple of years ago in university there was a class on ancient greek um i think literature or something like that Ancient Greek history, yeah. So there was a class in ancient Greek history, and there was a kind of like a comparison between Athens and Sparta. Sparta had oral law, and Athens had written law. And there was a question that was asked to us at the end of the class, that, the, and we will get the answer of it at the start of next lesson. And the question was, which one persevered better? Which one was better understood? Which one continued without contradiction, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So basically, which one was better? Right. Mm -hmm. And most people, myself included, said written law, obviously, at least you have something written. It's going to last until that's what we taught. But it turns out it was oral law because or with oral law, you have you're basing the principles of that through action, through that continuous community. And so mm -hmm. these weird interpretations, you don't get them in oral traditions because Pretty much everyone will basically notice something you're saying is off. Whereas with written law, what what eventually happens, and I think the way I see it, the U.S. Constitution is a great example of it, where you end up basically seeing that over time the written letter will lose power, right? And another group of people will start reading this and they will infer completely different things. And you know you need to have a mechanism from uh, not letting that happening. So for us, we have the church, we have the body of Christ Himself, and in, in other instances, you know, without without that institution, you can't really preserve that. And, and you end up being the institution yourself, pretty much. And that's the last thing you want to do if you want to be humble, I suppose. You don't want to make yourself the institution. Yeah, no. And, and, and there, are, there are definitely priests who, even in the Orthodox Church, will do that. They will set themselves up like the institution, or you'll even have bishops who will do that. You'll, you'll have bishops who will say things uh, that completely contradict the words of Christ in Scripture, including you know, where salvation is and how one is, and uh, you know, or or they'll go completely against um, the wisdom of the Holy Father and what they shared and how they interpreted things. But, yeah, yeah, that 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 definitely does happen. Which is why, although we speak of a normative authority, it doesn't mean that we make these people popes, right? And no, you know, that's. Uh, I will. I will say that what. The number, the way I see it, and maybe you can disagree, but the way I see it is that uh, discernment, that's the word I was looking for. Discernment is the key thing for me personally, because I had many instances, me personally, when I was reading theological texts, for example, and I saw statements from different fathers contradicting themselves on the, on the face of it, right, or contradicting what I've learned. And I kind of, and I, I was, I will basically ask myself, okay, what does this mean? One side, for example, says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The other side says, Father through the Son. Oh, the, you know, this is strange. But then when you actually, yeah. you, are, you are well studied, you can easily see through the smoke and mirrors. You can easily see through the obvious issue. And you can say, yeah, yeah, I read this. I know what this means. And it doesn't mean what you think it means. 
And this yeah, happens like so a difference many times. between the economic procession of the yeah. sun uh, of the spirit versus, um, you know, the the hypostatic procession. Exactly. Which, of course, uh, filioquists out there get confused. Yeah, um, and that's one of the and, examples and, of yeah. you know hard work and humility, where you need to kind of understand. Okay, if I don't understand this, is it the deficiency with the history, or is it a deficiency with me? And you, most of the time, it's the deficiency with you. Sometimes it is a deficient. You know, sometimes a father gets things wrong, but ninety percent of the time, the deficiency is on the part of the reader, and the reader needs to read more. And if you want, if you are to connect this with prayer, I think it ends up becoming that you know. There's a good reason why the Bible and church history is so difficult, and prayer. All of these things are so difficult is because they're kind of supposed to be difficult. They're supposed to challenge you because with challenge Precisely. comes growth. And with growth comes sanctification, glorification, and salvation. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's about obtaining that pearl of great price. You know, and the, the thing with, with prayer and, and why it, it is so difficult is because a lot of the time when we try to be our own spiritual father, which is a really dangerous thing to do, we're going to give ourselves the prayers and, and, and a rule of life that will be built around preserving the passions because we're going to try to make it easy and accessible for us. If, if your prayer rule isn't challenging you, um, then you're not going to grow. It's just like if you weights that you already have mastered lifting in the gym, you're not going to grow beyond that. You're going to struggle to grow beyond that. You're going to be stuck in this, this state where you're not gaining any strength. You're not getting any weaker necessarily. But you're not getting strength. But then the problem is, is when a greater challenge comes, you're not going to be fit to deal with it. And, and there will always be greater challenges in the spiritual life. The devil's always going to throw a curveball at you. You don't. Expect. His goal is to keep you out of church, is to keep you away from prayer, and to keep you from confessing even sometimes those hidden sins, those, those passions that we're not aware that we struggle with. And we can't see these things on our own. You know, it's, it's really hard. Um, you know, the, the heart, the noose, is only like a mirror once things have started to settle. And that comes under the guidance of a good spiritual father who uh, is, is being led by the Holy Spirit and who is prescribing a way of life to you that is going to allow for things to get still and get calm so that you can see that reflection more clearly. You know, it's, it... Yeah, it, for example, you can't really cut your own hair, right? You can be the best barber, but you can't really do that. And so similarly, if you're a doctor, you can't really operate on yourself so we can't really operate on ourselves that's the way i kind of understand it and that's a good way to look at it yeah but this kind of gets into a difficult aspect especially in the modern day which depending on the place you live it is kind of difficult to find for some people a spiritual spiritual father that has enough time and that, that you have a relationship with because for example in the west i believe there's a shortage of priests for example, I don't know if you all agree with me, but there's a shortage of priests. 100%. <laughs> um, e even in Orthodox countries, one can argue there's some kind of shortage of priests, just not as bad. So how do you manage to check yourself? I mean, do you just find, you know, people from your own community that are as serious as you? Or what would you say is the solution to, you know, fulfilling that at least temporarily until you find someone that can right, guide you much better that is a really good question um and and that is definitely something that has been asked and uh, of me before and the more i look at it the more i see is that, yeah you you'd want to find people who are just as serious who want to accomplish what you want to um that meaningful uh prayerful life you know to live orthodox and a lot of the time it's going to require you being honest and being honest with yourself and being honest with them and saying, hey, you know, sitting down with, with maybe a good Orthodox friend of yours, telling them, I'm struggling with a really deep issue. Um, pray for me. You know, and, and if the person, and, and you have to trust these people because, of course, your friend shouldn't be trying to prescribe prayer rules to you. Um, they shouldn't be trying to necessarily assess your issues and working them out. But, you know, you don't necessarily have to be bust to know that it's a bad thing. You know, if, if you're struggling with something that is eating up your life and destroying it, you know, if you're um, not going to work and you're playing video games, you know, 24 seven, if you're, you know, drinking every single night because you, you're, you're not able to deal with the struggles of life, well, then, you know, typically anyone knows that that's not right. Now, in terms of getting the 
proper help for that, you got to leave that to the right people to help you. Um, you know, it's like it's like you said, you, you know, you can't be your own doctor, and and people who aren't doctors can't be your doctor either. You know, you don't want someone who um, you know went to school for pharma uh, for being a pharmacy assistant trying to perform an operation on you. It's not going to go well. But in terms of being able to, to speak to each other and having prayerful support, that's important. And, uh, and, and maybe even just drawing on each other's experiences and saying, well, you know, um, I'm not recommending this and saying that you helped me, maybe this will help you. Uh, you know, maybe this prayer helped me, or maybe this father helped me. Um, so maybe they'll help you too. You know, and, and yeah. 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 And this kind of gets into kind of a problem that I have with people online. Uh, well, some online communities is that, the way I see, you know, a lot of people tend to like to say things like, you know, internet is not real life. It's hyper, you know, and I agree with a lot of these things, but mm. whether it's the internet or whether it's correspondence by letter, you're still engaging with, you know, someone that is your family, right? Or part of your family at the very least. And uh, what I'm trying to get at is, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I saw someone post basically a disrespectful meme of a priest that's that has a YouTube channel because he doesn't agree with some of the stances on reception that he has, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I don't even want to get into the reception debate. I'm just pointing yeah. out that you know, unless that priest is a, like a manifest heretic, which he obviously isn't, right? Yeah, uh, you should really post something like that. So I kind of uh, while we're on the topic of spiritual father and its importance and the importance of elders. Uh, can you kind of touch a little bit on why we should, you know, be more careful and we should try to be respectful of our elders and what it looks like in orthodoxy? Because I think a lot of people don't really understand what respecting your elders looks like in, in orthodoxy anymore. It, I, we actually kind of had a good idea of this. I will say people online, like prior to the meme virus, but they don't really have this <laughs> understanding anymore. So what, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, in terms of uh, proper respect for, for elders, we have to remember one thing. If we believe um, that someone who's a monastic has surrendered their, their life to try to follow God, even if they make errors, we have to respect their calling and realize that just like us, they have a struggle. And maybe this is a particular struggle with them that they're, they're having a hard time over. Rather than immediately um, socially anathematizing them or attacking them, the first response should be to actually pray for them and pray for God to correct them. Um, the other issue that we, we have to really be careful with when it comes to criticizing, uh, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm a, saying I'm, you know, I'm a priest, feel bad for me, you know, I have it so hard, but priests do have it hard. Um, priests, deacons, bishops, when, once you get into this position, you have the title father or vladika or despota attached to you, the devil knows it. He's, he's there at your ordination. And the first thing he wants to do is make you fall. Why? Because if he makes you fall, he's going to make other people underneath you fall. And he does this via two ways. Either he's going to break your faith by making you idolize the priest in a way that you shouldn't. And then he makes a mistake. And then what? The whole of your faith just goes out the window. There are people who say, well, you know, I, I really was serious about orthodoxy, but then my spiritual father said a heresy or did this scandalous thing. And now I can't be a Christian anymore. My faith is shattered. Or the other thing he'll do is he'll, he'll tempt you to commit the sin of judgment, to, to criticize, to harden your heart, and to, to not have that um, as, as St. Paisio said, that, that honor and that love for another person, in which out of that honor and love, um, you will either pray for that person or do some form of self-sacrifice. And, and rather than seeking to correct them for the sake of their soul, people will point out their errors to say, look how smart I am. Look what I know. I'm, I, see, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that priest. Oh, that priest said an error. Oh, this on, on the reception of, of a heretic. And, and, you know, I'm very strong on my stance with how reception is. I believe we should baptize everyone who comes into the door. And I know there will be people who disagree with that. And you're, you're more than welcome to disagree with me on it. But my, my thinking is, is that, of course, I try to apply things the best way that I've been taught. Um, and out of respect for the church and for the fathers and for the belief that this is the body of Christ, this is the way I do things. But when it comes down to respecting our elders, we have to remember that these people have been put in this place by God to lead. And if you believe that they have, you know, 
the grace of the Holy Spirit and their ordination, and you start slandering this person, you're also slandering God's uh, ability to choose and make use of people. Now, are there wolves who sometimes come in? Yes. But, you know, not every shepherd that has turned out to be a wolf always necessarily started out that way. Sometimes there are things and circumstances that made this person into a monster. And even if they do get deposed or removed from office or uh, excommunicated, we should always be praying that God will correct them and bring them back to repentance. Not necessarily back to leadership, but back to repentance. Yeah, that's a, that's a factor of excommunication that I think is pretty different from Western understanding. I mean, even when I was not a Christian, the way I understood excommunication is basically like exile, right? Like you're excommunicated, yeah. you're exiled, get off, we don't want you anymore. Whereas in the Orthodox perspective is, it's it's basically a very radical penance. And it's a last yeah. resort. It is really for everyone's good, both for the communities and really for the good of you to... Uh, be excommunicated if you're really preaching unacceptable things that are that are heretical it's not seen yeah. as something as if you know you're damned or something like that but uh, rather you know hey this is the body of christ speaking we've, gave, we've given you enough chances this is what we have to do and you need to fix yourself that's kind of how it is how i understand it to to be and in fact i mean even penances i've i've heard people say penances are excommunications which kind of goes to show that it's kind of like yeah it's, it's, it's misunderstood it might, yeah it might have a more light meaning is kind of what i'm trying to say it's not in the same sense of a bishop doing that to another bishop but it's more so just kind of like you know no communion for like seven days for example that's yeah. technically excommunication but it's also not the same as what we see in history right yeah it's, it's not a, a, an on-standing canonical excommunication in which you might have a period of years or an indefinite, you know, excommunication until the renunciation of a heretical uh, teaching or an, or an error. Um, but that's the thing is, is that you know, an excommunication is it's rehabilitative. Actually, it's intended to rehabilitate a person. You know, if you're going to keep communing this person despite their error, they're not going to realize that there's anything. But if suddenly you put the hard foot down and you say no. You will not approach the chalice. This is going to be dangerous for you. It's not going to be good for you. And it's not going to be good for the community because it'll scandalize them or lead them astray. You have to isolate that issue. You have to isolate this person who now has contracted a terrible illness. And they have to get better. And if they follow the prescription of their spiritual father, if they renounce their errors, and if they approach things from a proper prayerful place and from an attitude, they will recover. Or if they don't, then the best thing that we can do is prevent that issue from spreading to other people. You know, that's, that's why heretics were anathematized. You know, it, it wasn't to immediately punish them, and even then it wasn't an overnight process. You know, there was attempts made to get them to stop, to get them to, to get back on track. And when they refused, that's when the church did what it had to do, the only thing it could do, and that was to cut them off. And so by doing that, they prevent other people from you know, heresy does separate the soul from God. Um, and at the same time, hopefully by letting the devil have the body that God may have the soul, the person will go through a difficult time and realize what they're missing. Yeah, and, and whenever when we miss something, we, kind of, we tend to understand its importance, right? Uh, and that's another kind of like, it's part of human psychology. And I think a lot of Orthodox practices tend to line up with human psychology near near perfection, if not to perfection, is what I tend to notice about Absolutely. these kinds of things. Yeah, and Absolutely. Which gets to kind of ortho the idea of Orthodox psychotherapy, which, will you say that's the same thing as spiritual warfare, or do you, will you say that Orthodox psychotherapy, because I'm hearing this term a lot from respectable well, authors as well that are Orthodox, so can you explain what that yeah. means, or... Is it similar yeah, to what we well, already talked about? It, it is. It's, 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 a, it's a part of it. Um, St. Paisios describes, um, and, and another term for Orthodox, confession, confession with the spiritual father. Um, but St. Paisios describes this really, really well when he's... Well, you get Are you, you cut off or the last sentence? Can oh, you repeat that? Yeah, yeah um, St. Paisios uh, describes this as being like a soldier in a battle. 
And when you get wounded, you have to go and see the medic. You have to go get your wounds dealt with. And you could have battlefield trauma. And, you know, the period of recovery could be But the whole idea is to get you patched up and back out onto the battlefield. And that's what orthodox psychotherapy is. Um, you, you, and in all reality, the best exorcism for anyone is confession. Um, it's to go there and to address it. Because the difference with orthodox uh, psychotherapy versus more modern methods is we're not going to look to cover the with how do you simply control your emotions and your responses to it, but what is the root cause? How do we eliminate it? And how do we get the person more aligned with Christ, who is the only person in history <laughs> who is perfectly well, who had no illness whatsoever? You know, and, and so the only way that we can become perfectly healthy is by being conformed to that perfect person. And, and that's what orthodox psychotherapy is. It's bringing the person... Um, on a spiritual level, uh, you know, on a, and on a mental level, into alignment with what is healthy and normative. And what is truly healthy and normative is what is God-willed, what is within the law of God. Um, anything outside of that, anything outside of what God ordains is, is oftentimes going to be corrupt and impure. And, and we see that, you know, uh, we have, you know, things in media where we can use, uh, you know, media can be either there's something very good or very bad. You know, you can go on your computer and you can go and, and, and look up um, things that are graphically violent, uh, you know, pornographic, or you could look up an Orthodox channel and watch something that will hopefully be profitable to your soul. And it, it's the same really in the spiritual life when it, when it comes to, the, you know, your day-to-day -day practice. You're going to have situations where you're going to maybe be walking along and, and by the end, he's going to tempt you. And you could get wounded. And then the first thing you're going to have to do is go see your spiritual father, get some medicine, get healed up, and get back out there into the fight. And uh, a, a lot of this is, is just about restoring the person to the original state that God would have us be in, you know, which is in cooperation and alignment with his will. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of a statement that Dr. Bradshaw make, made about uh, scriptures where he basically said for Saint Paul uh, the aim of man you know uh, being possessed by God or something akin to that uh, I don't remember the exact quote but it was something akin to you know the, the fulfillment of our nature is not the destruction of it or you know it's being turned into something else but rather the fulfillment of it right so union of so union with God the, the purpose of creation fundamentally is Christocentric basically and that's kind of what i've it tried is. to get at and uh that's why we have lives of the saints because as saint paul says imitate me as i imitate christ imitate the church fathers imitate the apostles imitate the saints so who imitate christ so that you might also become like christ and the reason why we have these imitators is because each human being is a unique mode uh, that exists uh or mm. exists in a unique manner and so each of us have unique proclivities, unique understandings of reality, although we share the same reality. And so this is all recapitulated by having the basis, which is in our nature and the aim of life, and also the, the plurality of different lives which live the same life. Uh, I, in, when I read uh, Father Seraphim Rose's Vita Patrum, which is uh, St. Gregory of Tours' uh, Lives of the Saints. Uh, he mm -hmm. makes a point that in Latin, they, use, they typically say life of the saints because they participate in the same life. And that's why mm -hmm. we look to them, right? It's the same life that, that we're trying to be part of. It's the life of Christ that the saints participate. And by looking at the participant, we emulate them and we, you know, Live yeah, that it's, it's honestly like lighting your candle off another one in that way. Um, you know, it, it kind of passes on the torch. And, and that's why the lives of saints are, in all reality, one of the first things that I tell them to start reading. You know, dive into the lives of saints. Um, you know, a lot of the time I, I recommend that first before the gospel, because then when they'll go back and read the gospel, especially if they're Protestants, suddenly they're going to see it in a new light. They're going to see, oh, this is how I... Lives of saints. Are the gospel lived? Can you repeat action. that last sentence? <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 lives of saints are are the gospel lived in action. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they they show us how to live the commandments of Christ and how to how to actualize that in our lives. And without them, 
we're, we're again, we're going to be trying to, we're going to be trying to follow our own example. And a lot of the time, it's just like with your prayer rule, your, your way that you live your life and manifest your is going to be conformed to your comforts and not necessarily be something that is going to challenge you, force you. You know, it, it's like, uh, you know, before I was a priest, I was a personal trainer. And uh, one of the things that I, I always told people is if you make your own workout program, you're eventually going to plateau because you're going to be working out to make yourself comfortable. You know, you're not going to be pushing past your limits. You're not going to be looking for what your potential is necessarily. Um, you'll, you'll want to achieve that potential, but you're not going to want to do things to push your body to the limit to do that. And if you do, well, then you could delude yourself and that you know better and you're going to injure yourself. You know, and this is what St. Paisios talks about as well. There's, there's a series of five volumes that you, you can usually purchase them from a monastery. Um, I think David knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> With Pain and Love for Contemporary Man was volume one, I think. It's spiritual counsels, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and volume five on passions and virtues and volume three are really good. For, I mean, all of them are great for understanding spiritual warfare. But but volume three and volume five really kind of give it to us at um, that I would say anyone can really understand this with time. Um, I would recommend reading something like this maybe after you've been Orthodox for at least a year and have kind of breathed in the atmosphere a bit and, and learned about the lives of saints, because there will be things that saints can say that will shock people who are new to the faith. They don't really shock us who have had a chance to breathe it in a bit more. You know, we, we see that continuation of that mindset. Um, and, and that's, again, you know, an important aspect of this is, is obtaining that phrony mindset. It's about attaining that mindset and the mind of the fathers, um, and and of course looking at how the elders present the faith to us. You know, a lot of the time, you know, you'll you'll get two sides of the coin with with elders. You'll get people who will uh, call everyone an elder and essentially worship them and put them on a pedestal, put on. But then you'll get people who will disregard the elders and say we should only listen to logic. You know, we shouldn't listen to saints. We shouldn't listen to elders, and that that has its own dangers too. Because then we're not looking at people who've had that transformation of the heart, who have you know had that enlightenment, and we're now looking to people who have a more scholastic point of view. And the problem is, if we rely too heavily on scholastic, we're we're going to lose that heartfelt aspect of the faith. But if we rely too heavily on the mystical part, and you know we have to remember we're most of us are people living in the world, most of us are not monks. We're going to delude ourselves and become crazy. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so you need the scholastic angle. You need good modern theologians who have a good uh, orthodox understanding of things to keep you in track, you know, kind of keep you grounded and keep you rooted to reality. But you also need the elders. You need the saints to keep you uh, healthy in the sense that you don't withdraw into your head too much and that you don't become, you know, essentially just a, an, an orthodox Latin. You know, yeah. you don't become somebody who's just scholasticizing everything. Like what we see a lot of the time with them, yeah. You know, and, and then you know the problem is is that that can even lead to, to we see that in um, Catholic saints. You know, where the difference between the Orthodox saints, you see this consistency in their spiritual struggle. You you see this consistent um, self abasement, but not to the point where they're they're going on these long tirades that are poetic about how wretched and awful or how worthless they are, but rather realizing their own limitations and needing to exceed those limitations with the help of God. Um, and as St. Paisio said, if God keeps you in a certain place with your spiritual life and isn't allowing you to it's so that you don't fall into delusion and so that you don't become prideful and then harder to cure. So, you know, if, if we're progressing along, but we feel like we're making progress, then we're usually pretty safe. You know, we, we have to not give ourselves that comfort or that reassurance. We have to just think, okay, each day I'm going to try to do my best. Um, and you have to acknowledge it's never going to be enough and that it's an ongoing work, but there's joy in it. And, and that's really how you obtain that kind of humble mindset to the best of your ability um, without fooling yourself into thinking that you are humble or that you have perfect humility. Um, we, we have to avoid that. Uh, you, you had uh, a question, David? Uh, no, I was just thinking that uh, I was. Just, I just had one last question, and then maybe we can get to some questions in the chat and kind of finish this off. We definitely, I will say, at this stage already, uh, future appearances for sure. 
Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. One. Yeah, yeah. One last question I have is, uh, what what would you say to someone that is convinced of orthodoxy, wants to be orthodox, but has no orthodox church near him at the moment, and he doesn't know mm-hmm. when he will be near one? What do you think he should do? And maybe you know, I I will say I I have an answer to this, but what would you, for example, say to that person if? Let's say they became Orthodox, they didn't have an Orthodox church, they read, they prayed, etc. And then they, you know, let's say they passed away without going to an Orthodox church once in their life, for example. What would you say to that person? Because I had someone basically say, well, aren't we saved by baptism? If that's the case, then what if I never get baptized because I don't have a church near me? What happens then, right? So what would you kind of say to yeah. people in that situation? <clears throat> well, first off, I, I would definitely say... Glory to God that He has, uh, where you are in a in, in a spiritual desert. Really, He has come to you and He's giving you uh, a, a leading towards the truth. He's He's led you towards His church. Now, if you die before receiving baptism, having desired baptism and wanting to be Orthodox, God isn't unmerciful. Um, divine justice um, is far greater than human justice, and that, uh, as again Saint Paisios in his wisdom points out. That divine justice is really predicated upon the mercy of God. that his his mercy is present in all aspects of it and so if someone dies uh, before they can be baptized and having wanted to receive the mystery of the faith and not you know it's, it's a lot different when you have access to that and you willfully remain ignorant you willfully don't go to the church um, you know, you you look for every other avenue but going and receiving the mysteries then at that point God is going to say to you well, you, you had opportunities, you know, and you wasted them. But to the person who didn't have opportunity, good to draw to me. And, and, and so he's going to be merciful. And I truly believe that those people will have, uh, and I can't speak for the judgment of God, I dare not do, but I, I don't see God sending those people to hell. Um, I don't see him condemning them simply because they couldn't get into the baptismal font. That being said, I think the best thing to do if you're in that situation is to try to get in contact with the priest, and if it's possible, see if a priest can come out there. Um, there's ways that priests can baptize you without being in a um, I mean, typically, we should be baptizing people in water and streams, and the canons even allow, if there is no water, literally, the only water you have can is you from a cactus. Can you repeat the last sentence? Uh, oh, <laughs> I, I think you were. I think you, cut out at? Yeah, just the last sentence. But I think I, I, I got it. But maybe some people didn't get it. You were talking about emergency baptisms. Yeah, I mean, in a case of emergency, you know, if you're truly in a desert, you know, the only source of water is a cactus. You know, the Holy Fathers even say you can baptize with sand. <laughs> you, know, you, you can do that if you don't have, like, if if all you got is cactus water, you can't obviously can't immerse someone. And God isn't unmerciful. He's not. You know, we have to remember that sacrament is not mad. Um, that just because you don't have the water, you, you need the intentions and this certain formulaic thing, well, then it's not. Sacraments aren't magic, they're synergistic. Um, they're, they're, they are God working with man. Now, that being said, we have to respect the mysteries. We have to respect the way they've been done, uh, the way that they've been done and handed down by the instruction of our Lord and through the Holy Fathers. But when that's not possible, there are other avenues we can take. Uh, now, if it's not possible for a priest to get to you right away, there, there's there's other couple options. Um, you can uh, try to move and be where there's an Orthodox church. You can try to find work. You can try to move. And if that's not possible, then the best thing you can do is try to share your faith with your friends and with others. Get a community together. Write to a bishop and and ask for them to send a priest and start a mission. Start start a parish. Yeah, I think that's that can work. Depend, especially if it's in the U.S., right? Uh, yeah, they tend to be more active uh, in other places. I, I I will agree with the desire point. I mean, uh, I think there's a, there's a if you type classical Christianity Saint Ambrose of Milan baptism of desire. There's a there's a article where it there's a quotation from Saint Ambrose. It was a funeral of someone that's important. I think maybe even the emperor. I don't know. But he basically said, well, he, he desired baptism. And I think he was a catechumen. And he said, well, he desired baptism. And, you know, he was my spiritual child. And he basically says, you know, that's what that's what's important is that desire, right? But at the same time, mm-hmm. as you point out, if you willfully refuse to do so, 
like you have the chance to be baptized and you willfully by your own choosing refuse to do so then you can't really make that point either and we also kind of have to differentiate between the actual baptism itself and the desire uh because some fathers do distinguish that that's at least how i see things yeah. but i will definitely agree that i i think it will be pretty crazy to to basically say that God in his providence allowed someone to become orthodox and right before allowing the conversion to happen, you know, providentially allowed him to die and then said, okay, I'm going to judge you. It, to, it, I don't think it really matches up with our vision of what sacraments are, our vision of what salvation is, but I am also a created human being. I might not be able to see something deeper in, in this, but I think yeah. this kind of understanding tends to like the kind of like the radical understanding comes from like, the more like yeah. Augustinian mindset, Thomistic, yeah. Reformed mindset, they, they tend to have this inclination of like being more like if you yeah, if you don't wanna, do it to the letter. They want to put everything into a box, right? And, yeah. You know, they, they want everything to kind of fit that cookie cutter idea of what uh, of what they think it should look like for, for salvation or theology. Mm -hmm. um, and th there will be someone out there who is inevitably going to ask, well, okay, well, if this person wanted to be baptized, why would God uh, allow them to die before then? Yeah, that's. I think that's a actual, and you know, the the, the answer I, I can I can guess. Like, if I was in that position, I'll probably say, "Well, they didn't they didn't really want it, or something like that, right? Like, <laughs> oh, they didn't really desire it. Oh, they never really were queer Christian, like something like that, right?" And it could be that, <laughs> or God, God in His infinite wisdom and in His mercy could have foreseen that this person, upon their baptism, could have fallen into a terrible vice, or yeah. they could fall into a bad way of life, and so God will take the point. <laughs> where whatever the outcome will be in in the next life it'll be better than what it would have been afterward because you know one thing we have to remember is once we're baptized once we're in the church there's a higher expectation on us you know and, and even though you know we, we have to make sure that people understand you know just because someone dies outside the faith uh you know having had some kind of basic belief does not necessarily assure them um you know what there, does there it is, not assure again uh uh you know just having a basic belief um doesn't necessarily assure paradise yeah. you know th there's a reason why christ had to become incarnate um there's a reason why christ tells uh tells us in the gospel at, at the end of matthew 28 to go forth into all the nations and baptize all nations in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and also to teach you know to to instruct them concerning all the things the the apostles and so we have to we have to remember that God is merciful, but that if we're lazy and we have access to the sacraments, God is going to judge us based on that too. And if God does take someone's life before they could be baptized, it, it is ultimately for the better of their soul. You're going to die the way God wills you to die. You know, if God wants someone to 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 die, you know, I think Father Cosmo last talk. It, it, I don't know. Have you have you heard the latest talk that he did? Uh, I all I know is that he he came back. Uh, I was yeah. aware of his channel, but he came back after a long hiatus. It's something about the importance of reading the lives of saints in in light of uh, meme viruses and stuff like that. Yeah, and and, and uh, overcoming the the heresy of meme viruses. <laughs> that's that's a good way to put it. Um, but it's like he pointed out: if God wants you to die from the meme virus, you're going to die from it. If God wants you to be murdered, you're, you're going to suffer that. Whatever God wills, ultimately, is going to be for the betterment of your soul. Or will be some kind of mercy that's extended towards it, you know. And and we could do that more in a future talk, maybe sometime with talking about the soul after death and what the mercy of God looks like in various different situations, um, because that's a really extensive topic and <laughs> one that would we we'd never we'd never get to anything else if we were to get to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I think that's a topic of its own. But um, one question that I got from the audience, and then I'll allow you to be freed from me. Uh, it's about uh, scientifically confirmed Eucharistic miracles that's in the Catholic Church. Are you aware of them? That the science. Oh yeah. yeah. I, what, I, what's I, your I heard... take on that? Um, well, here's my take on it. Uh, we saw in the Book of Exodus how, you know, and and some of us, of course, might have seen the the DreamWorks movie, The Prince of Egypt. And there's one little bone I have to pick with that movie, and that's when Moses is performing the miracles. Uh, through God, you know, with with uh, the staff turning into the snake, and the Egyptians go and do it. They make it look like the. But in Exodus, we're given a totally different. Can you can you repeat that? We're given. 
So, uh, so, so in 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 this yeah. uh, children's movie that depicted, they make it look like you know only Moses' staff turned into Egyptians were forming. Egyptians were yeah. Uh, I I don't know why, but the voice cuts off. Oh, it's, it's, it's yeah. you know it's the Egyptians. It, it makes it look like the film like they're performing magic tricks, sleight okay. of hand, you know, illusions. Okay, um, yeah. that they're they're just swapping out the sticks at the right time for snakes, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with smoke and mirrors. But in the in the scriptures, that's not what we're told. Mm-hmm. In Exodus, they say that it is it is by their 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 evil gods, by these demons, that they do these things, that they they replicate the miracles. But we see something when the Egyptians have their stabs turn into snakes. The staff of Moses, which has become a snake, devours them, because it shows the power of God over these demons who can replicate things, who can imitate. And so this this is maybe going to start a little bit of a fire. But Eucharistic uh, miracles in the Catholic Church, I do not believe in them. I do not put any stock in them. The Church doesn't put any stock in them. The Orthodox Church doesn't. Um, we believe it to be a, a demonic illusion. You know, the, the devil can take flesh and blood from someplace else and transport it. You know, we see in the lives of saints, both pre-schism and post-schism, where the demons have transported people, places, and things. And they can, you know, create illusions, and they can move physical objects. And they will do this not because people will glorify God, and, and, I, and I'll expand on this in a moment, but to lead them further into their delusion so that they're further from and this is why heresy is so dangerous, dear ones. Um, heresy separates the soul from God because it creates an idol. It creates a false image of Christ, a false representation. And you start to worship that false representation. You become attached to it because it's easy, it's poetic, it's beautiful, whatever. Even the devil can appear as, a, as an angel of light. And so when we see these Eucharistic miracles happening in the church and they do these DNA tests on them, why would God give the holy things to the swine, to the atheist, to these people, to put under a microscope, to poke and prod. You know, th- th- this this isn't this isn't the reality. This is, uh, I would say, it's it's purely demonic, and uh, and that it is at the height of prelist uh, on, on the ecclesiastical level with them. And uh, you know, this is why we don't see stigmata in Orthodox saints. We don't see these erratic um, visions and ecstasies and. Uh, borderline uh, erotic fan fictions of Christ and the saints that you'll see <laughs> amongst, you know, especially uh, later on French Catholic, uh, you know, saints. Um, you know, again, it, it it's far removed from what the sober reality of the Orthodox faith conveys, and that the Eucharist does become the body and blood of Christ in an incarnate. This is why we don't use terms like trans. Oh yeah. Uh, I think you said in the last sentence it's cut off, but this is why we don't use terms like transubstantiation and by, while we do believe in the transformation of the uh, bo- the bread and wine into the body and blood, right? Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we, we do believe it becomes the body and blood of Christ. Yeah. It's it's an incarnational mystery. Mm-hmm. But we, we don't use terms like transubstantiation uh, because we don't we don't try to fit God into a box. You yeah, know. and and I'd I'd go as far as to argue that that's it's a it's a novel term. I mean, you can like in a in it a is. sense you can use it in the sense to affirm that, like uh, in opposition to the Calvinist doctrines, which was what happened in the 17th century at the time. But uh, it's a novel term. I mean, transformation is a patristic term. That's what change is a patristic yes. term. And in fact, um, with for example Saint Peter Mogilla, what's interesting is that in a and I think Bishop Sylvester points it out is that transubstantiation in St. Peter Mogilla was pretty much understood as change, which is the patristic term. So it's kind of like a reorientation yes. of the novel term to the old understanding rather than, you know, how the people on the other side of the aisle, so to speak, think of it that way. But one last question from the audience that I got uh, is, so someone asks, help, I am forced to attend the Protestant church, but I want to become Orthodox. Problem is that nearest church is five hours away and I will get problems with other family members. So in a situation like this, because this does happen in some countries, not in my case, which is actually crazy, but it does. This happens a lot in America, actually. What would you say to this person like uh, the, the the nearest church is very far away. His family is forcing him to go to a Protestant church. 
what should he do? What's the best way to navigate this situation? Now that, that's a, that's a tough position to be in. Um, age can be a factor, you know, when you're a minor and you're in your parents' house, um, and you don't have any choice on where to drive. That can make this this difficult. Now, the best thing to do is to start learning the Orthodox faith, to do your best to learn it, to watch videos, read books, learn how to pray. And if you want, I mean, if, if, if this person is in, is in the, you know, the servers where I am, you can reach out to me and we can maybe talk a little bit more in person. You know, I, for the sake of the audience and, and for maybe questions people might have that are, are too shy to ask him or just don't, don't uh, know how to frame these questions and answer it. But this, these situations I find always have deeper personal um, factors going on in them that have bit by bit, and I, and I don't want to just cut. Kind of, um, but in a situation like this, the best thing you can do, age is a reason why you can't. Again, do everything you can to learn. Try to share your faith with your family. Um, try to get them to see why you're attracted. Try to try to apply that in how you live. You know, when when I became Orthodox, um, originally I was the only one in my family who would do it. My wife thought I was nuts. She's like, "Oh, come on! You know, we were you know we were going to the Latin Mass because I, I was Catholic for a few years." Yeah. Um, and then you know I, I said, "No, I really don't. I don't like this Western stuff." And I, I started going to the Uniat Church. But I found that was very hollow and very, uh, forgive me, but, you know, schizophrenic theology is the best way I could describe it. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, it was around that, close to that time when I left it. Uh, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? It, it, was, it was around the time when I, um, when I left the... Good theology. Oh, it, it cut off again. <laughs> it cut off again. Oh, I'm my sorry. goodness. We got we to gotta fix that for the next time. Right. We got to fix that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Was, I actually had, it was around the time when I left um, the Ukrainian Catholic Church uh, that I saw your video on Catholicism uh, and the issue with uh, with Roman Catholicism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's that, that's and, around that time that that video was released, I think. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, this is really helpful." Um, mm -hmm. But you know, the the thing is, is that I was the only one who. And, you know, my, my family, even though I wasn't living with Protestants, um, you know, I was telling my mom, my dad, my it's just, you, you know, it's just like with the other thing with the Catholic stuff, it's just a fad. Um, my wife was like, you're crazy. You know, we just, we just started taking Catholicism. Oh, it's cutting off said, again. It, it's cutting oh, off wow. a lot more than it used to be. I think it's like with Discord voice activation settings. It might be. Um, I'm, we'll have to figure that out for the next time. But to wrap to wrap up what I was going to say, yeah. um, by living the example, by showing mm -hmm. uh, the, the transformative effect of that is sometimes enough to convince other people to take it seriously. And so if, if, if you work really hard on learning the and trying to live it in a way that makes it attractive to your family, they might be willing to make a trip out of town for the weekend to go to a parish five hours away. The first thing I'd recommend you do is get in contact with the priest there. Mm -hmm. Call him up and tell him you're interested in Orthodox. Ask him if he can help guide you with your study of the faith with your PC. Yeah. And then go from there. And mm -hmm. if he's willing and you know he can get permission from his bishop, he can come down to you and baptize you where you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and and then you know he can come visit you maybe even once a month and bring you Holy Communion. I I mean if if I was within driving distance, I'd be willing to um, I, I have been willing to make long distance trips to help out people. And so I can't imagine a priest who wouldn't be, um, you know, it's, it's, it's what we're supposed to do. So don't be afraid to give him a call, ask him if, if he can guide you and tell him how, you know, you believe this is for whatever reason, there's an issue. Feel free to reach out to me in the discord. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that's another thing is that, uh, father Mikhail is in fact in, what is known as the Diacord, the Orthodox Christian Discord, uh, and you can you can find him there whenever he's online because the priest in the in the members list is always on the top. So whenever they're online, you can check them out. And if you have any questions to him, uh, any advice that you want from him, I'm sure you will assist them. Right? 
to the best of my ability. <laughs> yeah. And we, we actually have many priests, like uh, Father Justin is another one who is also in our mm -hmm. sir. That's quite helpful as well. I think this will be a good opportunity to wrap it up. It's already been quite long, and I, I really enjoyed yes. having you on. I thought this was very fruitful, and I'd like Thank to you, have David. you on. Again, especially after we fixed the sound issue, of course. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to come back and uh, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was a, it was a blessing for me to be here and speak with you. Yeah, likewise. So thank you all for watching in the audience and thank you for joining us, Father. Uh, I will thank see you.